Vamos. Damas y caballeros, felicidades. Bienvenido a la tierra prometida de Dios, Monterrey, México. Anda, que es querido que se cabe. ¿Está bien por decir, querido? Es el bebé. Today we're going to talk about the use of stem cells and regenerative medicine for the management of chronic pain disorders. Just out of curiosity, by a show of hands, how many individuals are practicing medicine, regenerative medicine here? So, very few. Anybody using platelet-rich plasma, for example? Or bone marrow-derived or adipose-derived mesenchymal stem cells? So today we're going to have a very interesting discussion about these situations and when we utilize them. What are the indications for regenerative medicine? Who is a good candidate for regenerative medicine? What are the contraindications? What are the risks associated with the use of uh, regenerative medicine? Back up. So I'm a professor of clinical anesthesia and clinical surgery at the University of Illinois College of Medicine in Chicago. I'm presently working at the Pain Center in Illinois. I have nothing in terms of disclosures or conflicts of interest when I present this information to you. I have published approximately 200 peer-reviewed articles in medical literature. I've also published about 100 textbook chapters exclusively detailing the uses of regional anesthesia and chronic pain therapies. I've also delivered in the United States, but worldwide, 1,000 continuing medical education lectures and seminars. I've been a, the chairman of the Department of Anesthesiology with the residency program. I did that for 14 years. And I've been a pain fellowship director at two major programs, including Loyola University in Chicago and Advocate Masonic Medical Center in Chicago. I'd like to talk about the mechanisms of action of the use of uh, different regenerative therapies. I'm not going to talk about platelet-rich plasma because time will not permit that. I'll talk about bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells, adipose-derived mesenchymal stem cells, and even the use of placental-derived mesenchymal stem cells, and how we treat chronic musculoskeletal conditions, including low back pain. Is there an indication for injecting the intervertebral disc with stem cells? Is there a rationale for doing that? Can we inject the knee, the cartilage, the actual osseous structures of the knee, the hip, the shoulder, the elbow, the ankle? What are the indications for the use of regenerative medicine? As well as potential adverse effects, and what are the strategies that we might be able to employ to improve the outcomes in our patients who require or who are good candidates for regenerative medicine? So basically what we're trying to do with regenerative medicine is change a catabolic state Catabolism means the breakdown of tissues. We're trying to change that to an anabolic state of building up tissues, refreshing, regenerating, creating new matrix for the development of new osseous structures, new cartilaginous structures, for example. And in the process, we can reverse pain. Our goal, therefore, is to utilize the innate repair mechanisms that we all have as individual patients and as individuals across the world. We have the ability to heal but how do we hasten that? How do we enhance that ability to heal? And the use of regenerative med uh, medicine is really on the forefront of allowing us that prospect. So when we have injury and degeneration, for example, we have a liberation of interleukins, interleukin-1, tumor necrosis factor alpha. When we put ourselves in a catabolic state, we are reducing things like tumor necrosis alpha and increasing tumor growth factor, increasing interleukin-10, amongst other things. But I want to urge you to have caution when you utilize regenerative medicine. It's not a yellow brick road. It's not a panacea. And you have to be very wary of individuals who promote the use of regenerative medicine, including very esteemed individuals. This is behind me, Piero and Ursa. Does anyone know who he is? He was a professor at Harvard University who started out at the New York Medical College where I trained and Dr. Anversa went around the world publishing papers, published over 30 papers, suggesting that bone marrow derived cells, stem cells, could be injected into the heart, a damaged heart, a heart that had been induced to have a myocardial infarction, and that would regenerate the heart muscle that was damaged. And he showed this in mice, and he showed this in rats. And then in about 2016 or so, 
people got wise. They realized that what he was saying was not possible. You can't make heart muscle from bone marrow. It's not possible. Yet he was going around, there was such great hope, right? How many millions and millions of people suffering from myocardial infarctions and heart failure could be benefited by the use of stem cells? So we, and this is a, at the most prestigious university in the States, Harvard University, they had to retract more than 30 of his articles and they had to pay more than $10 million in fines because of this fraudulent research. Now he blamed his research associate, something I would have done, good, good boy. But he was the one, of course, at the head of the pack, and he took the fall for the fact that this research was fraudulent. So be wary of stories about the amazing capabilities of regenerative medicine, whether it's platelet-rich plasma, bone marrow-derived, adipose-derived, or placental-derived uh, mesenchymal stem cells. Here I am in the earlier stages. This is actually last year, because I still do platelet-rich plasma. How many people in the audience do platelet-rich plasma where you extract a sample of a patient's blood, typically 50 cc's or 50 milliliters, and you mix it with an anticoagulant and you spit it in a centrifuge like this, and you weigh it, you measure it, and then you inject it back into the patient at a fraction of what you extracted. So if you took out 50 cc's of blood, maybe you get five or six or seven cc's of product. Platelet-rich plasma filled with growth factors. Is it effective? It's effective for some conditions of inflammation. And that's what differentiates platelet-rich plasma from mesenchymal multipotent stem cells. Stem cells are used for degenerative conditions, not for inflammatory conditions. It's a huge point of variance. I know what some of you are thinking out there. You're saying, are these really his arms or is this fake? This is, this is real, I assure you. Nothing's been altered in any of these photographs you see today. So mesenchymal stem cells. Where do we get them from? From all over the place, basically bone marrow, adipose, placenta, exosomes, for example. <laughs> There's a, a reason why we use them. They don't create an allergenic reaction in the majority of people. There's no major histo histocompatibility complex too. So we don't get an allergic reaction when we use mesenchymal stem cells. Bone marrow, adipose, exosomes, alpha-2 macroglobulin, for example, and stem cells stimulate the growth of other stem cells. They also stimulate differentiation of the host tissues into the necessary components for healing. There are three major factors contingent upon the benefits of stem cells. Number one, they must be capable of division and self-renewal for long periods of time. What does that mean? That means if you inject somebody intravenously with 100 million stem cells, how many people think that's a lot of stem cells here in the audience? How many people think that that's too many stem cells, 100 million stem cells? placental derived, it's actually a reasonable number. In this very city, in Monterrey, Mexico, three weeks ago I injected over 40 patients with 100 million stem cells, in this city, 100 million stem cells. Professional athletes, some of the highest quality National Football League athletes that are well known to many of you in this audience received 100 million stem cells. Unspecialized can give rise to specialized tissue types. Mesenchymal stem cells require lower levels of inflammation than PRP, the rich plasma. So that's the benefit of stem cells. You use them in chronic degenerative conditions, osteoarthritis, osteonecrosis, degenerative disc disease, not in an acute inflammatory situation like we might use uh, platelet rich plasma for, for example. And this is what a specimen is. You can see the plasma, uh, bone marrow, aspirin concentrate, buffy coat, red blood cells. Now, the sources, I've already told you the sources of stem cells. Bone marrow, adipose, placenta. In the United States of America, we really can't use placental-derived stem cells, which is why I work with a group here in Mexico, in the Ana de Antigua, several places across the globe, and we are able to do that because of a little bit less restrictive drug and, and food and drug administration type oversight. We're able to do these procedures in places like this to the gratitude that we have to our host city, which is an amazing city. Mesenchymal stem cells induce endogenous stem cell activity. They facilitate the regeneration of damaged tissue. And unlike what Dr. Anversa said, Professor Anversa from Harvard, they can create some new tissue, primarily bone and some cartilage, but they do not create damaged heart tissue muscle into new heart tissue muscle. That is not possible. Not with bone marrow, not with adipose derived, not with placental derived, not with exosomes. 
not from alpha 2 macro globulin. So be wary. So here's an interesting case. Report this stimulated my interest in the use of bone marrow derived mesenchymal stem cells. It's a multifunctional mixture of red blood cells, platelets, nucleated cells. It's the nucleated cells we're most concerned about. So this was a patient with systemic lupus erythematosus who had osteonecrosis of the knee, and the authors went to the uh, hip area, to the iliac crest, they extracted a sample of bone marrow, they spun it, they re-injected it back into the patient, and they recreated, they healed a fracture much more rapidly than we allowed nature to take its course. Bone marrow derived, multipotent mesenchymal stem cells. Here's an, another uh, look from uh, Melissa Lomonaco. It indicated that when you have injury to peripheral tissue, cartilage can expose the underlying subchondral bone. Now what happens when you expose the underlying subchondral bone marrow? That's capable of producing mesenchymal stem cells in a variety of growth factors, which hastens healing and reproduces that injured bone and cartilage. Cartilage repair is not as good. I have to say this again, cartilage repair is not as good as bony repair when we use bone marrow derived mesenchymal stem cells, but it's decent. The levels of evidence in favor, for example, of treating osteoporosis, osteoarthritis of the knee is level two. And I will go through with you the levels, the range of level of evidence in favor of all these conditions. How about for degenerative disc disease? Most of us in the audience have patients who are aging. The aging population worldwide is expanding, is exploding, and they have the natural process. They all go through Thompson's criteria of degeneration. You have changes in the cartilaginous matrix of both the nucleus pulposus as well as the annulus fibrosis. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could recreate new cartilage, for example? We know that in healthy discs, the nucleus is filled with type 2 collagen. When discs age, they go through the seven steps of Thompson's criteria for degeneration. That type 2 collagen is transferred and transformed to type 1 collagen. This is very unhealthy tissue. So we have found that bone marrow derived mesenchymal stem cells have been shown clinically and in the laboratory to recreate nucleus pulposus type cells. How does it do it? It does it by changing type 1 collagen and replacing it with type 2 collagen. The type 2 collagen is that which healthy younger people have which supports the, the, uh, the bony structures above and below the disc. So it's very important to consider this a rational reason. Now, does that translate into a clinical situation? We know in the laboratory you can change type 1 collagen to type 2, the healthy collagen. And so there are some studies that show this. Here's a, a review of six studies. It was a systematic review published by Wu fairly recently in 2018 in the journal Spine. He looked at six studies and he found in humans that there was a 44.2 point reduction in pain in individuals who had undergone intradiscal injection of bone marrow aspirin. So that's a fantastic change. That's on a 100 point numeric rating scale where zero is no pain and 10 is the worst imaginable pain. In addition, there was a difference in the osteoporosis disability index for patients who are less disabled. And so there's level three evidence for intradiscal injections of bone marrow aspirin, intradiscal injections of stem cells. <laughs> Hip disorders, Chawla showed in a review article successful use of bone marrow concentrate for hip osteoarthrosis and arthritis. Evidence supports the use of bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells for osteonecrosis of the femoral head. Good news, as our patient population ages, more and more individuals have osteoarthritis of the hip, for example. Intraarticular mesenchymal stem cells is the best use of stem cells. Remember this. If you put aside everything else I tell you today, the levels of evidence in the peer-reviewed literature are type two, grade two. It's not number one, but it's not number five. It's a very robust evidence in favor of the use of bone marrow-derived mesenchymal stem cells to treat knee osteoarthritis. Level two evidence is the highest of anything we have today. Higher than intradiscal injections, higher than hip injections, higher than anything else, Ep epidural injections, which I do, facet joint injections, which I do, and SI joint, amongst other uh, targets. Here's a nice paper from David Noriega. Mesenchymal bone marrow uh, cells injected into the intervertebral disc. We had 24 patients. Half the patients got mesenchymal stem cells injected in the disc, and the other control got a sham injection of, into the musculature of saline. Now, what did they find out? Well, the patients who had the stem cells in the disc had better pain, statistically significant, at up to six months and even up to 12 months, 
an improvement in their oswestry disability index compared to controls. Intradiscal injection, small group of patients, 12. Here's another study of 12 who received the therapy and 12 who did not. How about adipose derived? We've been talking about bone marrow, bone marrow. Can you take fat out and liberate the stem cells? Of course you can, many people do that. And do they work? So this is a study in knee osteoarthritis by Lee Kim 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 and Jin. Let's say that again. Lee Kim 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 and Jin. So there were 12 patients who received mesenchymal stem cells articularly into their knee versus 12 patients who got normal saline. And you can see the patients who got mesenchymal stem cells into the knee did fantastic. From the adipose, now we're talking about taking it away from fat compared to taking it away from the bone marrow. And they did serial MRIs in all these patients up to six months and they showed improvement, not just clinically, but also structurally. Here's a study of osteoarthritis, a very large study by Gupta, trying to determine what's the optimal number of stem cells to inject into a knee. Do you inject 25 million, 50, 75, or 150 million? Nobody really knows. But this nice paper, each of these groups consisted of 15 patients, 60 patients total. They also added hyaluronic acid at the end of the injection, which I don't personally do, but they did it, and they found that 25 million cells showed improvement in every parameter, in pain, in functionality, in walking distance, in exercise tolerability, in lifting capabilities. So it appeared from this study that 25 million cells is decent. Here's another study from Espinosa's group, intraarticular injection of two different doses. They used either 10 or 100 million cells and they followed patients up, and it appeared that there were some minor differences, showing that maybe 100 million cells was better than 10 million, but the data is not that robust. 25 million cells injected to the knee is certainly acceptable when you compare not just pain, but also functionality. They followed these patients up for 12 months. Here's a Chris Centeno who's done a great deal of work with intradiscal injections of stem cells. 33 patients, low back pain, bone marrow-derived mesenchymal stem cells, and he looked at MRI findings in pain. Let's go to pain first. You can see that about 80% of individuals were improved up to five years. Five years after intradiscal injections of stem cells. And they also showed a reduction in the size of the bulging disc by about 25%. It's a phenomenon that I haven't been able to reproduce, although I do lots and lots of disc injections with mesenchymal stem cells. Fantastic paper. Dr. Centeno has done a tremendous amount of work with intradiscal injections of mesenchymal stem cells. Here's from Ken Patine, degenerative disc disease, two cc's of autologous bone marrow to the nucleus pulposus, and they found that less patients needed surgery than those who did not receive the bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells. Only six patients at three years ended up going to surgery. What did they find that was important? That the number of colony forming units greater than 2,000 and CD34 positive cells greater than 2 million determined the outcome. So it's not just the number of cells, 50 million, 25, 75, it's what type of cells. It's the viability of the cells. The cells having higher numbers of CFU and CD34, those patients do the best. Those patients typically heal without requiring for surgery. Back to adipose derived, we've been talking back and forth, bone marrow adipose derived. Here's a study that looked at either 20 or 40 million cells, and again, they found that there was a reduction in patients going to surgery and improvement in pain and functionality from the 12 months in patients who had adipose tissue derived mesenchymal stem cells intradiscally injected. Now, I was privileged here. I don't know if Dr. Uh, um, Abdel Syed is in the room, but he participated in this study as well, here he is right here, Dr. Abbott El Syed. We published this on behalf of the American Society of Interventional Pain Physicians in the journal Pain Physician, looking at the literature in favor of stem cells. This is very important, I'm gonna to try to go through this pretty quickly. As I already told you, there are three minimal characteristics of whether or not stem cells or regenerative medicine, including PRP work. One, the cells are capable of division, self-renewal for a long period of time. Two, they're unspecialized, and three, they can give rise to specialized cell types. So we've already gone through a little bit of this. We've made several statements in this publication. We've made several. 
one of the things that's most important is the levels of evidence. When you take all the world literature on a topic and you subject it to scrutiny and, and meta-analysis parameters and statistical derivation, you found that knee osteoarthritis has level two evidence in favor of its use. That is the use of mesenchymal stem cells, bone marrow derived. Intradiscal injections is level three. Other uh, conditions only have a level four. They're not quite good at all. Statement eight was that these cells cannot be manipulated. When you take that bone wire out, you can't start adding corticosteroids, you can't start adding vocal anesthetic, you've got to deliver the cells as intact as possible without adulteration. And so the Public Health Service Act of the FDA requires minimal manipulation of these cells. In fact, they consider it to be the same as when they deal with cartilage, bone, ligaments, muscles, tendons, and spinal discs. We also studied the use of low back pain, uh, stem cell injections for low back pain versus PRP. This is fascinating data, and I avail you of all to look at this paper that we published in 2022. The objective is to try to provide some guidelines for people who are just getting into stem cell use and regenerative medicine. How do you go about determining who is an appropriate candidate and how many cells we should be injecting in patients? This slide, if you have a cell phone, please take it out, take a picture. This is the most important thing I will tell you all day today. These are the levels of evidence that we studied many years. We looked at hundreds and hundreds of papers on regenerative medicine. So for platelet-rich plasma, there's level three in, uh, evidence in favor of injecting the disc. And again, the scale goes from one to five, so it's in the middle. For mesenchymal stem cells, there's level three evidence in favor of them. But for epidurals, for facet joints, for SI joint injections, the level of evidence is less, it's level four. That doesn't mean I don't do them. I do them in this very city. In this very city, I inject patients with placental-derived, human placental-derived, mesenchymal, pluripotent stem cells, epidurally, in the facet joint and in the SI joint. So this was our paper. We looked at PRP first. Six months and 12 months, we looked at pain scores. And you can see, here's the zero bar right here. Everything to the left, these are all the studies that were conducted, favors the use of PRP for chronic low back pain. This is at the 12-month period. You can see that the evidence continued after a single injection into the discs. Here's for uh, stem cells, and we looked at both pain and we looked at functionality using the Osprey Disability Index. And once again, here's the zero bar, here's the zero bar, and to the left it says it favors the therapy. So stem cell therapy compared to conventional medical management, physical therapy, and of course placebo is far superior. Uh, I want to just digress for one second. I'm a little bit over time, but not much. Uh, so, exclusive to myself, the use of uh, placental-derived mesenchymal stem cells for refractory trigeminal neuralgia. How many people in the audience treat trigeminal neuralgia? How many people here treat trigeminal neuralgia? Nobody? So about a third of the patients in this audience treat it. And I've been treating it for my entire career. I started off doing blind injections of the Gasseria and the ganglia, not very good. I've done some ultrasound. I did some fluoroscopically, and now for the last 20 years, I've done only CT scan guidance. We're the only people in the world who do these injections this way with stem cells. We do it here in Monterrey, Mexico, the only place in the entire world where placental-derived stem cells are injected into a human, into the Gasserian ganglion. We have an ongoing series of multiple patients. We do CAT scan assistance. We do 3D reconstruction. It takes me about 10 to 12 minutes to inject one side per patient. We've had 100% safety, 95% efficiency. When I say 95%, that means their pain is down below a two, and they're off all narcotics. That's what 95% efficiency means. You can see I'm over here, meeting with some of my heroes. Dr. Ramiro Ramirez, who's an orthopedic surgeon in this city, Monterrey, Mexico. This is Dr. Chadwick Pedromos, the head of the Pedromos Stem Cell Institute. This is the clinic where I conduct my injections. I also have the ability to use a CAT scanner at the Swiss hospital. Here I am doing a right-sided Gasserian ganglion block under CT scan imaging. This is me, where I'm injecting five million stem cells in seven-tenths of a cc total volume. And if you look at the CAT scan, this is an axial section. You'll see my needle tip here. I've circled it in red. 
and you can see the three-dimensional reconstruction. The dental structures are here. Here's my needle entering the foramen ovale on the right side. This is the patient getting the injection. This lady had intractable pain, was using 400 morphine milligram equivalents per day. She's off all narcotics. She's back to work. She's fully functioning. She's had no return of her pain. This was more than 18 months ago. Here's another one of my patients. You can see I'm at the Swiss hospital here. I'm injecting on the left side of the face. And once again, you'll see my needle, this little white structure, entering the foramen ovale, where the Gasserian ganglion resides. And all three branches, V1, V2, and V3 of the trigeminal nerve are found there. And here you can see a cat, three-dimensional rendition of the needle entering the foramen ovale. Here are some more pictures here, and you'll see it looks like a straw. This is going directly into the foramen ovale. Nobody in the world does this. We do this here in Monterrey, Mexico. No other place in the world is doing this. And here you can see, again, where we've now made a shadow brand of the picture showing the needle in the foramen ovale. I'm privileged to work with some of these world leaders in stem cell therapy. So in conclusion, regenerative therapy should be determined on a case-by-case -case basis if the patient is a candidate for regenerative biological therapy. And of course, you maintain compliance with the United States Food and Drug Administration. If you're doing these procedures in the U.S., of course, we always adhere to what the government regulations are. Now, we're just going to digress one more time. Morton's jelly, we didn't talk about that too much. Morton's jelly is a matrix between the two umbilical arteries and the umbilical vein. Morton's jelly is where we find a very high density and concentrations of human stem cells. Here's a nice study of 16 patients with advanced disease, and they were injected using ultrasound guidance. This is an ultrasound meeting. Of course, you're all ultrasound experts. This is a perfect utilization of ultrasound techniques is for the injection of Morton's jelly. And it was found that this would improve patients' uh, uh, knee injury osteoarthritic outcome score for 12 months. MRIs showed definite improvement over 12 months. Are there any contraindications to the use of regenerative medicine, platelet-rich plasma stem cells? Of course there are. Patients who have dysfunction of platelets, they have septicemia, they've got a local infection at the site where you're going to put a needle. Obviously that's a patient who is not a reasonable candidate for regenerative medicine. Anemia, malignancy is controversial. We used to say you would never inject stem cells in somebody who had cancer because you could spread the cancer. Well, that proves to be false. Yet and still, you'll see this published in many papers, in many textbooks, in many articles about the use of stem cell or regenerative medicine. Allergy, severe psychiatric impairment, we all deal with those in our everyday existence when we deal with our pain patients. So this is important because a multi-center study of 2,300 patients over nine years found only seven patients who had received stem, stem cell therapy who developed a malignancy. That's less than the general population. So stem cells do not induce cancer. They do not spread malignancy. This is a misconception. Of course, adverse outcomes can happen. Some patients get worse. Patients who get PRP almost universally get worse because we're causing an inflammatory reaction in those patients. They're gonna hurt. It hurts to inject the joint without local anesthesia. It hurts. These patients are not happy campers. Uh, what are the other current strategies? Obviously, these should be done under direct visualization, whether you're injecting the face, the shoulder, the elbow, the knee, the hip. You should have some mechanism. Ultrasound guidance, Dr. George Cheng Chen, world expert in ultrasound, can teach you these techniques. Take his course. Learn how to inject all these various sites with stem cells, or PRP for that matter. You avoid corticosteroids for a couple of weeks before you subject your patient. That's pretty much a no-brainer. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs at least a week. Some people would say two weeks before you go with regenerative medicine. Anti-anxiety medications should be used for some patients. The PRP injectate, we're not talking really about PRP, 2.5 times or greater the normal concentration of cells in a different in a specimen. A 19 gauge needle to draw the specimen. Some people say it's better not to cause apoptosis, not to have the cells break down. That's kind of old school, 22 gauge needle is perfectly acceptable whether you're talking about an aspiration for PRP or for stem cells. Instruct the patients to rest. Immobilization, we used to immobilize patients, believe it or not, for six weeks. I would do PRP in the elbow or shoulder, put them in a sling, we don't do that anymore. But a minimum of, a minimum of two days and up to two weeks is very important. We're looking for pain and functional improvement. We're not looking for structural changes, although that does happen in some 
decided that distinct cases may have some functional improvement that's associated with MRI changes, but don't go chasing MRIs. Don't send the patient for a very expensive radiological exam. Follow the patient clinically, look for pain and functional improvement. Ed says, and rest, this is where we try this first. If it doesn't work, we select our patient for regenerative medicine. We fail conservative therapy. So you have to document that you're failing conservative therapy before jumping into regenerative medicine. We're all excited, we're all enthusiastic. These therapies cost money. They require a great teamwork effort. They're not done free, whether it's here in this country or in the United States. So make sure that you've exhausted your conservative therapy. I thank you, I'm sorry I went a few minutes over. I appreciate it. Let's go, thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias.